moment. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. There we go. Today we're doing Sabbath school lesson, the covenant with Abraham. And today teaching, we have Elisa and Bob. Before we begin, though, Bob, can you lead us out in prayer? I can. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us this Sabbath morning. Open up the word. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts so these things can be understood by us, Lord. And not only that, but that we will do whatever you say. We want you in our lives. So help us to give this lesson and help everybody else to learn what we are teaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So today's Sabbath school lesson, Covenant with Abraham. We're going to talk about the covenant that Abraham had, but just in case anyone's unfamiliar, what is a covenant? Now we know by definition, for anybody new watching this, and actually, some people will go with seven, although we're going to stick with six today because one of them plays an important role in the covenant today. So there is the Noahic covenant with Noah, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant with Jesus that we're all familiar with. That's five. But we also have the Adamic covenant with Adam. And since it plays into the lesson today, especially with Genesis 3.15 and the promise of a Messiah, we're going to include that one as well. Now, I know the lesson states that this is the second covenant, but for argument's sake, we're going to go with the third because we included the Adamic one. Um, and we're going to see that because Abraham, this is the beginning of an everlasting covenant that is offered to all humanity, including us which was fulfilled by Jesus himself. So we see the promise to, of God to Abram and that he will make him a great nation. So we'll start with the memory verse, Genesis 15, 2. Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Now, after reading that, you may ask yourself, who is Eleazar? I didn't know Abraham had relatives in Damascus, but that's not the case. He is actually adopted. The SDA Bible commentary from volume one, page 312 says, the steward of my house, and that's the King James Version, Mesopotamian records, particularly from the city of Nunzi, N-U-Z-I, in the patriarchal times, have shed a welcome light on the hitherto obscure passage. These records show that wealthy but childless couples might adopt one of their slaves to become the heir to all their property and also to take care of them in old age. The rights and duties connected with adoption were written, sealed, and then signed by several witnesses as well as both parties to the agreement. So we see that Abram starts his journey off in this covenant promise and the culture of the Babylonian times, or really that time, believing that he and Sarai would have no children of their own, they adopted a son from their slaves, one endeared to them and trusted. But now we read Genesis 15 verses 3 through 6. And Abram said, since you have given me no offspring or no offspring to me, one born, in my house is, or one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, you sh So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So at first, Abraham or Abram believes that his descendant will be Eliezer. Now God promises him an heir from his own body. And the literal translation is from his inner parts. So from Abram's own flesh. 
So now we see the second phase of Abram's covenant walk, the will of man. After 10 years, apparently, they think that God needs some help. And we read verses 16, 1 and 2. I'm chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now we know this from studying the Bible. This was not uncommon during those times as well. And after 10 years, they apparently thought that God had some other intention or needed some help, whatever it may be. So Abram believes that um, it was counted to him as righteousness, but he's not completely trusting God yet. We're actually walking through Abram's journey and how he goes from that man of the world, even though he leaves where he lives, to that man that completely and wholly trusts in God. Now, does he have a saving grace right now? Has righteousness been attributed to him? Yes. But is he a work in progress? Yes. Aren't we all works in progress? Amen. Oh, boy. Yes, we are. So, we read and we see how Abram, in this 10 years, decides to count on the arm of flesh, his own flesh. And he's thinking to himself, it's from me, but... Genesis 17, verses 17 through 19. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who was 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now, this will come up in the lesson, but we see the first laugh in the Bible here with Abraham. And later with Sarah. And we see even, we hopefully we'll see in the lesson that even God laughs. But when we see Abram, Abraham on his journey of faith and his covenant with God, ultimately all the way to Mount Moriah, where he is told to sacrifice his son, we see this journey. And that is where we all want to end up because that's the ultimate example of faith. But whether you are Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, Abraham holds a special place in your heart as a spiritual father, true? Yes. But let's take it a step further. Have we ever followed the culture or the norm that's going, around, that's going on around you, even if it's wrong? I'll tell you what, Abraham's your spiritual father then. Have you ever doubted or lost faith? Abraham is your spiritual father as well. Have you ever trusted in the arm of flesh in your own life or dealing with the promises of God? Abraham is your spiritual father too. Have you ever backslidden or fallen flat on your face with your relationship with God? You know what's next. Abraham is your spiritual father still. Even if you've never heard of Abraham, are you part of all nations? Are you to be blessed through him? Then who is your spiritual father? Wherever we are in our lives, Abraham can relate and we can relate with him. His roller coaster ride of faith had its highs and lows. But our goal is not to be with Abraham and his failures, but to be with him in his covenant with God, that everlasting covenant, and to arrive at the same fate that he had when God called him to sacrifice Isaac, his son, trusting wholly in the Lord God. Elisa, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson? The faith of Abraham. Yes, indeed. Okay, so <clears throat> some time had passed now since God had first told Abram to leave Ur, go to a land that he would show him, and God had promised to make Abram a great nation and to make his name great, and he had also promised that in Abram all 
the families of the earth would be blessed. So that, of course, is referring, as we know, to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that would come through Abram's lineage. <clears throat> so in Sunday, we're going to study the 15th chapter in Genesis, verses 1 through 21. Um, we'll, we'll pick out some of the key points as well as read certain passages here. Um, but this time the Lord is coming to Abram in a vision. So let's take a look at verses 1 to 6 to start with. And it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body will be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and it, he accounted it to him for righteousness. So in verse 1 there, we see that the Lord comes and assures Abram and pronounces that he himself is Abram's exceedingly great reward. And then in verse 2 and 3, Abram questions the Lord as to how that former promise would be carried out given that he had no children. After all, Abram and Sarah were both getting along well, well in age for childbearing, so this was a big question on their mind. And then in verse 4 and 5 we read, that the Lord assures Abram that his heir will indeed come from his own body. The language used here is very similar to that the language that was later given to David through Nathan the prophet when God promised that the coming Messiah would come directly from David's lineage. And you can go and read about that in 2 Samuel 7:12. And then in verse 6, the Bible records that Abram simply believed in the Lord, and that belief was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abram recognized through this that there was nothing that he could do to realize the promise through his own works. Rather, he recognized the one who made the promise as being trustworthy and sovereign. Abram knew and believed the promise giver. Paul further explains the relationship between faith and righteousness in Romans chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. And that says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So the relationship between faith and righteousness is essential. In the land of Canaan, where God led Abram, the culture and the religions of the people required human works of one sort or another to gain the favor with the gods. Abram's simple faith was a stark contrast and stood out from the other inhabitants of the area. And that is not dissimilar to what we experience today. Yet we know that God has not changed. It's only by faith in him and what he can do and will do in our lives that we are made righteous. The story goes on in verse 7 and 8, where the Lord then restates that he will give this land, the land of Canaan, to Abram as an inheritance. 
Abram had not yet entered into the possession of Canaan, so now questions God, saying, How shall I know that I will inherit it? In asking this question, Abram did not suddenly change his mind and lose faith in God's promises. Instead, the experience he had recently had with war with the king of Elam and um, all of the strife and struggle through that was really pressing on him, and it was hard for him to really see through that. Ellen White comments on this in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 12, speaking of this aftermath of the conflict and the impact that it had on Abraham. She writes, Abraham gladly returned to his tents and his flocks, but his mind was disturbed by harassing thoughts. He had been a man of peace, so far as possible shunning enmity and strife, and with horror he recalled the scene of carnage he had witnessed. But the nations whose forces he had defeated would doubtless renew the invasion of Canaan and make him the special object of their vengeance. Becoming thus involved in national quarrels, the peaceful quiet of his life would be broken. Furthermore, he had not entered upon the possession of Canaan, nor could he now hope for an heir to whom the promise might be fulfilled. In a vision of the night, the divine voice was again heard. Fear not, Abram, were the words of the prince of princes. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. But his mind was so oppressed by foreboding, forebodings that he could not now grasp the promise with unquestioning confidence as he could before. He prayed for some tangible evidence that it would be fulfilled. The patriarch begged for some visible token as a confirmation of his faith and as an evidence to after generations that God's gracious purposes towards them would be accomplished. The Lord condescended to enter into a covenant with his servant, employing such forms as were customary among men for the ratification of a solemn engagement. So our merciful God recognizes our human weakness and how swiftly we are overcome by the terribleness of sin and the enemy's warfare against God's true, peop true people. In the final verses of this chapter, we read about this uh, sacrificial ceremony that is performed by Abram and ratified by God. And in verses 11 and 12, we see that Abraham is fighting off the, uh, off the vultures and a horror and a great darkness falls upon him. God then reveals to Abraham that his descendants would be strangers and slaves in another land for 400 years where they would suffer much affliction. Verse 14, God promises he will judge the nation and bring out Abraham's descendants with much possessions, and at that time they would give, uh, he would give Canaan as a possession. And then in verse 16, God further reveals that this timing is by divine providence. It says specifically, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And then in verse 17, God himself symbolized by the smoking oven and the burning torch will passes through and consumes the sacrifice, signifying that the covenant promise is based on the work of God alone and can be trusted and relied upon by Abraham, his descendants, and those of us who are spiritual descendants of that promise. And uh, we'll go ahead and close out that and move on to the next section. All righty. Bob, okay. can you tell us about Abraham and his doubts? Well, as far as I can see on Monday's lesson that uh, this really shows God's patience with us because this happens more than once in our story that Abraham doubted. And what happens when we go out and try and fix things ourselves? And it usually ends up to be a mess. And so we're trying to look here to see what exactly happened. And we've already read part 
of uh, Genesis 16, 1 through 16. So I'm going to start here with uh, Genesis uh, 16, 3. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt. Now, they did have some patience because this is 10 years later after they dwelt there in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised of her eyes. So we can see right here that there's a problem coming up here, isn't it? And, and I'm kind of surprised that uh, Sarai, Sarai, Sarai I actually blame Abraham for this whole thing. How did that does. turn around, you know? Oh, that's right. He made me eat the apple, and, uh, you know, it's always the blame game, and it's always somebody else. So here it is, the spies of her, and Sarai said unto a Abram, My wrong is upon thee, and I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was the spies of her eyes, and the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, the maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai had dwelt heart, heart, hardly with her, she fled from her face, and the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness. And when this is said, the angel of the Lord found her. I always thought in the back of my mind, was this an angel or was it Christ? And we look over here, in uh, where it says uh, in Genesis 16:7, it says the reference to the angel of the Lord in Genesis 16:7 is a title that is often identified with the Lord Yahweh. So that was actually Christ that, that was in the wilderness talking to her, and the things he said kind of shows that it was her, was him. So. When came thou, and whither thou wilt go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, Thou art with child and shalt bear a son, and it shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard, heard thy affliction. And it will be a, a wild man, a hand with, will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now can you kind of see right there by what's going to be coming up? And the Lord already predicted this whole thing. It's still going on now, thousands of years later, Con between those two. Right, the consequences of, of acting on his own. Yeah, it, it was uh, amazing. And did the Lord know what was going to happen? Yes. So just my advice is to allow the Lord to guide you, allow that Holy Spirit to come in your lives, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you into all things that he wants us to do. So let's... After we've read that, I think we pretty well have the idea of what's going on. Let's go to Galatians 4, 21 through 31, and see what actually is taking place here between these two children. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Anybody want to be under the law? Half the time we don't want to be on the law, but we end up being on the law because of our actions, right? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. By the way, when we accept Christ, who do we become sons of? Become sons and daughters of Abraham. So that, how much importance and significance God put in this man. But he who was the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. So being born after the flesh, what, is, what does that mean? That means that they took it in their own hands. And being under the law, they said, okay, let's go ahead and out and fix this thing. 
which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. So what did the people say at Mount Sinai? Don't worry, all these things we will do. They didn't uh, include God in it. They said, all these things we will do, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travelest not, travel, travailest not. So the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Are we still being persecuted? Indeed. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of, of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And this, amazingly enough, she was cast out, wasn't she? So, still, after this, God reassured him that he would have a son. So because at this, up to this point, he still having a son, didn't have a son. Abraham seems to have lost his faith. And he does not believe anymore that it will be possible for him to have a son with Sarai. So I actually, in my mind, feel that God waited until it was really impossible for them to have children. Sarah wasn't just at menopause. She was way past menopause. Uh, yeah, both of them. I think when he had Hagar, he was, uh, I mean, uh, Ishmael, he was uh, 85 years old. So I can imagine after that how old he was. Right. And uh, one thing I always wondered, Abraham sat there and laughed, and God didn't say a word to him. But when Sarah laughed, he got her for that. He said, but uh, that, that uh, I don't know what, maybe you guys can come up with the answer. Well, to that. when Abraham laughed, he was actually worshiping God. So maybe it was just like an out of wonder or amazement maybe or something like that. Well, it could be. Could be. Yeah. So... Basically, what we're doing all the time, I really got to my time already, huh? Mm. Gee, man. What we always do, and the wrong thing that we always do, is do we try to fix things ourselves? Then we ask God, hey, God, can you help me out? I really messed things up. This thing is going to last for thousands of years. Can you fix it? And so God basically, say, yeah, you're yeah. saying we should always come to God first. When you get up in the morning, you go to Him. Right. And you ask for forgiveness and things that are going to happen during the day. You want to run to him after the middle of the day when you are tempted and ready to fall into sin? No, you have to right. do it before. Right. So that's all I got to say. That's if Abraham, <laughs> yeah, if Abraham would have done that, we wouldn't have the trouble we do today. Oh, man. So let's I look, always think about that. Yeah, let's look at Tuesday's lesson. And let's look at the... Sign of the Abrahamic covenant. So we see two actions in the covenant with Abram. First, we see the splitting of the animals in Genesis 15 that Elisa talked about. And God is the flaming torch in the smoking oven that passes between the animal house, reaffirming to Abram that God will keep his word about his descendants and the land to inherit. Ellen White writes, because we're going to see two parts, this and the circumcision. But Ellen White writes about that specific covenant and patriarchs and prophets. Watchful and steadfast, he remained beside the carcasses till the going down of the sun to guard them from being defiled or devoured by the birds of prey. 
About sunset, he sank into a deep sleep, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him, and the voice of God was heard, bidding him not to expect immediate possession of the promised land, and pointing forward to the suffering of his posterity before their establishment in Canaan. The plan of redemption was here open to him, and the death of Christ, the great sacrifice, and his coming in glory. Abraham saw also the earth restored to its Eden beauty, to be given him for an everlasting possession as the final and complete fulfillment of the promise. Ah, we can see by this that the earthly Canaan and the heavenly Canaan are truly both promises here. The second action of the Abrahamic covenant is the act of circumcision. This is a major point in Abram's life. God is meeting Abram here and telling him what he will become for both him and Sarai. And we read in Genesis 17, 1 through 5, and then verses 15 and 16. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram. And I want to pause there for a moment, because Abram means exalted father. But, and then verse, the rest of verse 5, but your name shall be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. And verse 15, then God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And Sarai means my princess or Abraham's princess, but Sarah just means princess, like for all. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. I love this. And God acts. And then Genesis 17, verses 10 through 11. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, in the ancient Near East culture, circumcision was practiced, but it was a mere ceremony or a marriage initiation. I hope it's not on the day, <laughs> but exactly. However, in Abraham's covenant, circumcision becomes a sign of God's extraordinary congenital relationship with his people. It is literally a sign of the commitment of the people had to their bridegroom, Christ. And both the covenant the animal has and the covenant of circumcision, we see a covenant of blood. There's always blood in a covenant, isn't there? So every time a child was circumcised, the blood from that initiated the covenant between that child and God. And by the way, how old did they have to be when they were circumcised? Eight days. Eight days. That was the perfect time. Here's a little medical <laughs> side note. Exactly. In eight days, the level of vitamin K is highest, and vitamin K plays a vital or pivotal role in the regulation and control of the clotting of blood. It's a medical fact. Now, how would Abram, Abraham know that? Exactly. Exactly. So let's see what the SDA Bible commentary has to say about circumcision. Ye shall in, in verse 11, ye shall circumcise. Okay, from the ancient times, various suggestions have been made in the explanation of this rite. The Alexandrian philosopher Philo, a Jew, believed it was ordained by God merely to promote physical cleanness. The others saw it as a protest against certain idolatrous traits practiced by the Egyptians and other heathen nations. Calvin believed it to mean a symbolic putting away of the fifth of the flesh, 
and so of sin in general. I like that. The foreskin just gets rid of all sin, huh? Oh, boy. The following points, however, may be noted with reference to the importance of circumcision. It was destined to distinguish, number one, to distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles. And we see that in Ephesians 2.11. Number two is to perpetuate the memory of the Jehovah's covenant. That's Genesis 17.11. Number three was to foster the cultivation of moral purity. We see that in Deuteronomy 10.16. Number four is to represent righteousness by faith. And we see that in Romans 4.11. And number five, to symbolize circumcision of the heart. And we see examples of that in Romans 2.29. And the final number six is the foreshadow, the Christian rite of baptism. And that's Colossians 2 verses 12 or 11 and 12. And we'll come to that later in the lesson. This is why I included the Ed Adamic covenant with Adam and from Genesis 3.15 because it is the first prophecy in the Bible concerning the Messiah. The Noahic covenant doesn't point to Christ, but the covenant with Abraham does. That is why it's so important to us today. I can now understand why, remember the circumcision group in Acts? The circumcision group, the Jews that thought you had to be circumcised? Oh, yeah. Why they felt that this was so important, but they just didn't get it. Because if we read Romans 4.11, it says, And he conceived the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And to further explain circumcision, why it was no longer needed, I love it from the SDA Bible and Commentary when it talks about it in verse 12. It says that Abraham was given specific instructions as to who should participate in the rite of circumcision and when it was to be administered. And basically anyone in Hebrew society that wouldn't be circumcised would be ousted. But the final part is what I love. With the rejection of literal Israel as God's chosen people, Circumcision ceased to have significance as a religious rite. And that is in a whole slew of verses in Acts and Galatians and Romans. So what does that mean for us today? We read earlier about how really both covenants pointed to the Christian rite of baptism. Colossians 2 verses 11 and 12, which I said we come to. And in him, you who were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. The covenant with Abraham and the covenant we have with the, uh, the new covenant both point to the same place. Today, if we believe in Jesus and accept him into our lives, we too have the same covenant promise that Abraham had and so much more. By the blood of Christ, the new covenant is ours for the asking to be heirs with him now on this earth and in the heavenly Canaan someday to come for all eternity. Isn't that a blessing? It is. Oh, boy, I can't yes. wait. So, Lisa, can you tell us about the Son of Promise? Yeah. Um, and, and just following on from what you were talking about, circumcision, because in, in Genesis 17, it, it walks through the actual performance of that circumcision. And we see in, in verses 26 and 27 that not only was Abraham circumcised and his son Ishmael, but all the men of his house, those born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. So God there was looking forward to when the son of promise would come, right. who is Christ, you know, coming through that lineage. Right. But the promise of that reconciliation to God was for everyone. It extended to the entire household of Abraham, which is the promise we have today, right? right? And, and Paul talks about this a little bit more in Romans 9, 6 to 9, and he says, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, 
for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as a seed. For this is the word of the promise, at that time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And then in verse 25 and 26 of Romans 9, quoting from the book of Hosea, he says, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said of them, you are not my people, that they shall be called sons of the living God. So we are part of that promise, um, which is, it, it's wonderful. Okay, so let's talk more about uh, the son of the promise in Genesis 18. And, you know, it first talk about this hospitality that we see in Abraham and, um, and then how God responds to this act of hospitality of Abraham. So in, in Genesis 18, 1 to 15, in, in verses 1 and 2, we find that the Lord again is physically visiting Abram, uh, but he is, he's coming with two other heavenly strangers. And they, they come and they appear as if they're strangers passing by. And in verse 3 to 8, we see that Abraham runs to them and bids them to stay and refresh themselves. And he's eager to relieve their weariness and give them comfort and sustenance. And it was not just this light lunch of leftovers, right? Um, the Bible says he took a tender and good calf, butter, milk, fresh cakes of bread. And furthermore, as they ate, he stood close by, attentive to their needs. So in this act, he showed much grace and hospitality towards these traveling strangers. Um, Ellen White adds um, some more information on this um, particular scene. She said that Abraham had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. And in that hot summer noontime, sitting in his tent door and looking out over the quiet landscape, Abraham saw at a distance the travelers approaching. And before reaching his tent, the strangers halted as if consulting as to what their course would be. Without waiting for them to solicit favors, Abraham rose quickly, and as they were apparently turning in another direction, he hastened after them and with the utmost courtesy urged them to honor him by tarrying for refreshment. With his own hands, he brought water that they might wash the dust of travel from their feet, and he himself selected their food. And while they were at rest under the cooling shade, an entertainment was made ready, and he stood respectfully beside them while they partook of his hospitality. This act of courtesy God regarded as sufficient importance to record it in his word, and a thousand years later it is referred to by an inspired apostle, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained strangers unawares. And you can read that in Hebrews 13 too. So Abraham's attitude of reverence toward these strangers really demonstrates a philosophy around hospitality that's more than just showing respect and care. The Bible emphasizes that this attitude of hospitality, it's a religious duty for his people, and that his true followers will exhibit this behavior. So let's read about this in Matthew 25, 34 to 40 for a better understanding. And it says, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. 
the, and then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, did, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. So this attitude of reverence and hospitality towards others really reflects Christ's love and grace towards humanity. He condescended to leave heaven and become a servant uh, to humanity in his ministry. And that ministry was centered around his compassion and service to the downtrodden, the tired, the needy, the sick, the poor in spirit. And his ministry lifted them up, healed them, befriended them, befriended those who were cast out. So our service on earth is really the same. Our service is to reflect the character of Christ, right? So what, did, what, was, uh, what was the Lord's response to this gracious act of, of hospitality by, by his servant Abraham? Well, Abraham's hospitality resulted in a rich blessing for both him and Sarah. The Lord himself then pronounced the promised son would indeed come and Sarah would bear this son at the appointed time. And at this moment, the Bible doesn't record how Abraham responded in, in that moment. But we are told that Sarah laughed within herself. So having waited so long for this promise and now being well past childbearing age, she was probably filled with doubt, right? And had probably given up on that promise long ago. Long ago. Yeah, so, you know, and it's, it's kind of, you know, humorous, really, what, what God does here. But um, to the one who knows our deepest thoughts, our doubts and discouragement, um, Sarah must have, you know, if, although she felt overwhelmed over the years for her barren state, that feeling of hers did not go unnoticed by God right? He, he did not forget Sarah. So in verse 9, the Lord asked Abraham directly, where is Sarah, your wife? So up to this point, the promise had only been given to Abraham, right? Now he includes Sarah, as, and, and, and she can hear what he is going to say. So by doing this, he, and including her directly in the pronouncement of the coming son, he's addressing her doubts head on and revealing that he is a Lord who, who knows her thoughts and doubts. And, but then what does he say? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Right? right. So he's like, you know, you're looking at it from a human perspective. I'm God. I created you and I can do anything. And, and so now when it seems to Sarah that she has been totally forgotten and that the promised son could no longer come. That's when the Lord is going to fulfill his word. So you, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, this whole story kind of ends up with God laughing, but, you know, he, he addresses her and says, right. but you did laugh, right? You know, um, even though she does, denies it. And even in Genesis 21, 6, that the verse says, God has made me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm sure, you know, God kind of winked at this as, you know, because he knew from a human perspective, this would be just so unbelievable. Right. You know, because we're confined to our human bodies and there's a time for certain things, but God is, God can overcome that. Can you imagine everybody talking about God <laughs> after this? You know what yeah. their God did? Exactly. She was really yeah. old. And she, she was 90. Right. Right? So. Nobody has a child at 90, let alone Not 70. Not even then. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. Anyway, and, let's go over to Thursday. I know, because we see that character of Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. When he greets him as guest, and we're going to see that character that really is coming from God continued when he barters with God over, over Lot and Sodom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bob, can you tell us about that? Well, just the first thing. What if uh, Abraham hadn't gone out there and invited him in? Say, hey, let these guys just go. They can just go their way, and there's no problem. Why should I bother? But he really, he went out of his way to invite them in. And they even cooked. He has all these servants and everything, and yet him and Sarah are cooking. 
and they have servants doing some of the other stuff, but they're involved. Fresh bread, everything else. Yeah. So I, I just wondered, you know, and, and another thing that I wonder too, is if he knew who it was, because, well, Ellen White says he didn't, but over there in Genesis 18 too, Abraham ran towards the men, sons, Adonai. Right. And if you ever see, well, a lot of times I watch the Hebrew singing on TV, on the, right. and Adonai is my Lord. Right, and it's actually used for God. For God. Because they wouldn't say Yahweh, the name. So that was the name they actually used that they could speak. So it makes you wonder if he knew. But after he, they said that I, Sarah laughed and she never did, it was just in her mind, then they knew. Well, they knew who. Yeah, then for yeah. sure. But I think he suspected beforehand, yes. I got an, uh, an idea for that because, uh, you know, but I've been wrong before. So now we're on Thursday, and here Lot in Sodom, and we went through all, we went through all the cooking and the really nice things, and they ate together, and uh, he got this nice message. What was a nice message for a 90-year-old? Right, for a nine-year-old woman. God promise of a son to Abraham has just been reconfirmed. He just got through reconfirming. Well, not only that, they said next year you'll actually have it in the flesh. Yeah, so what, what happened next? So, and the man rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And so what did... What did Christ say? This is actually Christ there, right? Right. Shall I hide from Abraham this thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. So this is again showing the importance of Abraham. After him losing his faith, denying things, trying a little trickery here and there, God... Christ still. There's a few other people in the Bible he did the same thing to. Yeah. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring upon Abraham which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Moore is great, and, be, and because there is sin and a very grievousness, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. I kind of feel myself. He knew what was going on. Oh, he knew. And who's I crying out against going. this? Yeah, he knew. And the, so, and men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abram, Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now, I just want to ask you, would you have that nerve? To stand there and start arguing with God? Well, he wasn't arguing. He well, was compassionately I said, I think it was arguing. bartering for He's them. He was bartering, all right. So he started out with what, 50? Yes. How far did he go down? To 10. 10. Okay, well, I'm going to skip a little bit here and go down to the bottom. It says here, did they really even get 10 out of this? No. no. Abraham, not Abraham, <laughs> Lot, his wife, and two daughters. And you have to now, think... Now, out of that four, did they all make it? Nope. They got out of there, but she turned around and turned into salt. So that way, that was what, what became of that. And then to realize that the whole nation would have been saved if there was ten. Now, I'm not sure how big that city was. Imagine it was fairly big. Yeah. And so you figure 10, couldn't even get 10 out of you there. You figure there at least had to be a couple of thousand people there plus. Yeah. Fine, 10 should be no problem. Well, it seemed like it was. But it is Sodom. <laughs> yeah. So what this uh, discussion was all about, we won't say argument, we'll say discussion. Okay. What was basically what Abraham, what was he basically doing? Interceding. In other words, it says here the Hebrew phrase stood before the Lord. I really didn't understand what that meant, but it says that it means he was praying for these people. 
Now, really, if you want to really put the most important thing in this whole thing, what should we be to be doing for the lost? Praying. Praying and mm -hmm. witnessing. You want to be standing there and Christ is coming through and the guy's standing there next to you and says, boy, I wish somebody told me about this. That'd right. be pretty shame, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, and even for us, do we have a high priest in heaven who's interceding for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd be lost without him. And Ellen White says, before you say anything, 80% of the work is already done by the Holy Spirit. So basically, when you talk to somebody and they have the Holy Spirit hasn't gone before you, what does the Bible say it is? Foolishness to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're talking to somebody and it's not foolishness, that Holy Spirit has already done 80% of the work. Mm -hmm. Waiting yes. for you and me. Yeah. So, we got through there. Abraham challenges God, and he starts with 50 down to 10. Mm -hmm. That would have saved the entire city. So, of course, when we read the story of what happened when the two angels came to Lot to warn him, and I hope everybody has, has read that. It's one of the stories where the, the, the angels went in there and Lot asked them to come into his place, and then they went and finally went into his place, and then the people around there came around and wanted to... to uh, have their way with have them. Have their way with them. That's a good way to put it. So... But they were under that covenant of Lot at the time. They were under his protection. That's why he tries to keep them safe. Yeah. Now, what? to me, I, I can never understand this thing. What did, uh, you know, where he was going to send his daughters out I there. know, I know. That, Don't that go there. Part, okay, I'll leave that alone. I guess you're right. Uh, he'd been in Sodom for too long, I think. But. <laughs> well, there's been others, too. There was another fellow who uh, cut his uh, concubine up in 12 pieces and and now, evil, you can, it just absolutely proves the evil that was in that city mm -hmm. and, and the things that were, they were brought down to. And if you really, I mean, just look around you today, how is things now? Getting there. They said the end of time, yeah. if we're going to be, I guess they were even worse than Noah's day. Mm -hmm. Continually, yeah. their thoughts were evil. Yeah. And so... Yep. We're getting there again. And I want to read you a little thing here from Ellen White. It says here, And now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the devoted city. But men perceived it not. The end of time, people aren't going to... It says in the Bible, they're not going to perceive what's happening. They're right. going to continue on with what they're right. doing. Be marrying and giving in marriage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. While angels draw near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was every other day that had come and gone the same. Evening fell upon the scene of loveliness and security, a landscape of un. Rival beauty was bathed in the rays of declining sun. The coolness of eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. And that's taken from, uh, from Ellen White. Mm. So basically... This thing is coming to an end, and they're kind of just going about their business, just like every other night. Yep. And I imagine that, uh, you know, Lot is keeping those uh, two angels inside with him. But what happened to the fellows outside when they tried to break in there and get, get those two angels? They blinded they them. They came blind. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was taking care of that. So we got down to the 10, and it says down here at the bottom of the lesson, God saved only Lot, his wife, and two daughters. And if you really, re if you really read on, mm -hmm. were, those, were all of them people of, of no. good report? They were actually saved because of Lot, I exactly. think. Exactly. Yeah, right. And really was odd. that city the only bad city around there? No. No, no there was quite a few. But it says in our lesson... The beautiful country was then destroyed. This was actually a very beautiful spot. 
Now you take a video or a view of what it looks like now. Yeah. Seen it. It's, it's right there with the Dead Sea. Yeah. And a lot of rocks and nothing supposedly else. Supposedly, that's, that's the spot. Okay, so I'll pass it on to you guys. Do what you have are, any final thoughts for the lesson, Bob? The final thought I have on the lesson is about praying. Prayer for the, for the lost. I was in that boat. Every one of us was in that boat. Yep. Yeah. And I know my wife prayed. And uh, that's what happened. She, right. Well, because I told her, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Just keep it to yourself. And she did. But something happened. So that's Amen. all. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Alisa? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, <clears throat> every time I read this story, I find it interesting how, you know, the promise is given multiple times over decades, right, um, before it's fulfilled. And to Abraham and Sarah, it seemed to tarry. And then it seemed like it would never come. And to me, that really is a, 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 a type of what the end of time is like. We've been waiting for the promise of the end of time God's people have right. for millennia, you know, and the Bible says that as we get close to the end of time, people will say, well, where is his coming? The fathers have said this, you know, and the fathers are gone and he's not coming, right? right. So the, the skepticism is going to be very, very broad and, and perverse within the world. And so, but yet what we find is that God's promise was true. Right. When it seemed like it could no longer happen, God fulfilled it. So, and to me, that was just a, it, it, it builds your faith when you think about those right. things, right? Well, because actually, his it could no longer from, happen if you really think about it. It could yeah. no, from a human perspective, yeah. it could no longer happen. No it had to have happen. the intervention of God, right? right? And so, um, even though it seems dire for us and that at the time has tarried for us, his promises are sure, and he is going to come. Right, and we know that. And even we know the last time prophecy was in 1844. Yeah. So yep. we know it's, it's coming. Yep. And looking at the world sooner than later. Yeah, for sure. So I'd like to read something from Ellen White um, from the Review and Herald in October 17, 1907. As the Bible presents two laws, one changeless and, one, and eternal, and the other provisional and temporary, so there are two covenants. The covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden when after the fall there was given a divine promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. Other versions say crush. I like that better. Um, and to, uh, to all men, this covenant offered pardon and the assisting grace of God for future obedience through faith in Christ. It also promised them eternal life on condition of fidelity to God's law. Thus, the patriarchs received the hope of salvation. The same covenant was renewed to Abraham in the promise, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's Genesis 22, 18. This promise <clears throat> pointed to Christ, so Abraham understood it, if we will refer to Galatians 3, 8, and 16, and he trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It was this faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness. The covenant with Abraham also maintained the authority of God's law. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me be, and be thou perfect. And that's in Genesis 17, 1. The testimony of God concerning his faithful servant was, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. And that's in Genesis 26, 5. And the Lord declared to him, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Well, who's Abraham's seed? Well, we, are. we all are, right. Yeah. So we are all heirs to the same promise and to the same salvation. I pray that Abraham might be our example to all of us. Was he always in a good spot? No. 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 Lied about his sister twice, not being his wife, among other things. But in the end, 
He trusted God completely to follow in all of his ways. Not out of obligation, but out of love for him who made us, who redeemed us, and who loves us more than we can ever understand. So let us be like Abraham, the one that has that final faith that's holy and with God. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we look to you in faith and trust. We look to you as the finisher of all things. And Lord, as we talked about, people say, oh, it's tearing. Oh, they, they talk about how during Paul's time, the end was near. And that was 2,000 years ago. Lord, we know that you are not slow to come about and fulfill these things, but we also know that you want to save every last soul possible on this earth. We pray and ask that your Holy Spirit may touch the hearts and minds of everybody watching this, that you might create divine appointments for each one of them, Lord, to receive your word, and if they already know it, that they might grow and be strengthened in your word, Lord, that they might have that trust that Abraham had, Lord, and that they might surrender completely. Even Abraham, he's the father of faith. And even he reckoned that Isaac would be resurrected if he sacrificed him. Help us all, Lord, to have that kind of faith in you and make you the priority in our lives, especially above ourselves. We thank you for your mercies and grace and the promises that we know are steadfast and true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone.